you know, thank you for uh, for joining us. I know it's I think it's uh, already closer the evening where you are. So, um, Maya, uh, where are you? What time is it? I am in my apartment in Tel Aviv. It's ten past seven. Still light outside, and uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, thank you uh, for for um, having you. Where are both of you? Where are you now, um, Joshua and Ruth? Well, uh, I'm in my apartment in Tel Aviv, right in the center of town, near the municipality. Uh, it is now uh, uh, the, the sun is uh, well. It is dusk now. I would say a very nice day, cool. Some it's 23 degrees or so Celsius, centigrade. Um, birds are chirping outside. You can't hear them because they close the windows. <laughs> <laughs> the, that's it. I'm in my room. Uh, very, very excited to share with you my thoughts, with your thoughts. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to listen to you. I think one of the lessons we have learned in the last three or four months is the importance of uh, listening to other people listening to what they have to say, what they have to cry, what they have to uh, shout or to whisper, or sometimes when they shut up, also to listen to their silence. This is what I feel, and uh, this is one of my lessons from the last uh, four months, uh, the importance of listening and um, really uh, interior interiorizing the suffering of others and um, to empathize with people who are suffering. This is uh, what I can say was one of my, one of the lessons I drew from uh, this um, lockdown that lasted here for at least two months very, very severely, which is now loosening up a bit, but it is still, the situation is still unclear. People you feel that they are uncertain about the future. I mean, about the closest future. They don't know what uh, tomorrow or next week uh, will uh, bring uh, along and what will happen to their daily life, to their normal routine, so to speak. Everything is disrupted. So there is a feeling of disruption, mostly and mainly. That's what I feel. Yes. Uh, maybe I um, disruption is, is, is a key word here, a good word. Um, actually, I'm now in New York. Uh, I came here for the spring semester, but uh, now I stay a little bit more uh, because of this uh, crisis, interesting crisis. And, um, and actually, when I, uh, when I came here in January, I I thought I would be very much isolated. I would be here. I would not know much about what happens in Israel, like to be detached from it a little bit. But, uh, but because of the pandemic, I found myself much more in Israel by Zoom and, and, and Skype and everything than I thought I would have been. And actually, I, I, I feel I have to... Uh, say something now because you spoke so beautifully and so painfully about the events um, around uh, George Floyd and we in Israel have now our own George Floyd which is uh, Ayad, Ayad al Khalek, uh, a Palestinian boy with special needs who encountered soldiers but he was didn't really understand what's happening and they killed him, they just shot him. Um, and this is um, something, we don't know what to do with such a thing, we, we just don't know. Uh, and I wish that we had that demonstrations that you have here, that we had it in, in, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, because here, this death aroused such a, an important, uh, um, power, um, and maybe this power would lead to some action. And unfortunately, in our country, 
It just isn't it? I don't know, Yoshua, Maya, you are there. It's sort yeah, of well, quiet about, uh, around it, isn't it? I, I, I would like to add something to what you said. The atrocity of the event is even uh, much worse than whatever what you described because uh, the, the man, he was a young man, uh, he was autistic. And he went uh, out in the morning to, to go to his uh, special school. And on the way, he met his teacher, a woman. She gave her testimony of what happened. She said that when the soldiers uh, asked him to stop and he was frightened and he, he sought refuge behind her back, he reclined behind her back and he said to her, I am with you. In a, in a way saying, protect me. And uh, one of the soldiers, they, they were policemen, kind of policemen, uh, approached him and shot him at point blank behind the back of his teacher. She gave the testimony. It is awful. Now, I also wish that uh, it will create a kind of shock wave in the Israeli public opinion. I am afraid it won't because we became so uh, um, indifferent to death of others in our society because of the ongoing uh, wars, uh, atrocities, and so, and so on. So I think that our public opinion is kind of benumbed, not really uh, awake. So I, if this event will not awake a, a wave of anger and protest and calling us to task, I mean, to say what did happen to our society, how can we go on living with such an event taking place in our capital, in, in Jerusalem? So that's what I have to say. It was, it's awful, awful. Uh, the event that took place there. And uh, it proves that something very, very destructive mm -hmm. happens to a society that is involved in, ongoing, in an ongoing conflict. People talk about managing the conflict. You cannot manage a conflict for so many years. It destroys your soul. It destroys your morals. It destroys your humanity, one's humanity our humanity, I mean. And the lesson is that we have to put an end to this conflict as soon as possible. But what I'm, what I'm afraid of is that the, uh, the new future will only contribute to um, pouring fuel on the fire because uh, our government presently is talking of... Uh, of um, um, no, uh, uh, um, the word which escaped me, to um, um, occupy. No, not to occupy. To... No, no, not to occupy. To uh, to <laughs> 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 uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, um, I'm checking. Uh, well, what's the word? It's uh, to, expect to, to, to append. Append to append. That's right. To append territories uh, in the west in the West Bank. And what what I can foresee is that uh, this is this is only going to uh, create another uh, wave of uh, violence, probably. So I think that uh, well, as as a playwright as um, people of the theater, we have to deal with the fact that something happened to us during these many years of the ongoing conflict, that something was deeply damaged in our humanity. And how do we bring it to the stage? Now, the theaters should be ready or should even take the initiative to open themselves to deal uh, with, the, with the, that reality and to, to um, confront the audience with the questions that uh, this reality is uh, bringing and bringing to the stage. 
I'm afraid that our, uh, the, our mainstream theaters are not ready to, are not willing and not very ready to deal with those moral questions. Um, really, we, we, we find ourselves always um, finally uh, bringing it up on the, on the fringe stages in Israel, which are very active. And the fringe is uh, doing its job, but it doesn't address the white public. And I believe that we should find a way to address the wide, the wide public with those questions. And now with the corona and the corona crisis and the questions that it also uh, confronted us with, yeah, well, by the way, the world is annexation, the world that I was missing before, mm -hmm. annexation of territories, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I talked a lot, so I hope that someone will pick up the, the thread and continue yeah. or confront me or whatever. I yes. want to say first that it, uh, it's important to say that it's absolutely not the first time that Israeli forces are shooting a disabled Palestinian person. And uh, the Israeli public is not really... I mean, the media is usually not covering it enough and people don't care enough. and this passiveness is not something that is um, characterizing our society now, but as Joshua said, this is something that has been ongoing uh, since I remember myself actually. And, um, and it's funny uh, how once you put three Israelis in the, on the same screen in the times of Corona, we talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I have to say that I'm, I feel a hypocrite uh, after, after a while of talking about it and being active uh, politically and also writing political plays, uh, especially now, I feel, I don't know, there's some kind of a feeling of hypocrisy to even talk about it if you don't do something meaningful. And the truth is that I also don't know any, anymore what I can do, if I can do anything. And now I'm seeing what's going on in, in the US and I'm thinking, I don't know if jealous is the, is the right word, but I wish, I wish something, and, and so many bad things are happening here. It's practically becoming a dictatorship and we're still sitting at home and we're not doing much. And um, I don't know, I wish to see some torches in the streets and they're not coming. And I don't know if I should be the first one carrying a torch or um, just wait for the one who takes it and starts running but it's not happening here. And I don't, I don't know anymore why and how come. It's, it's really astonishing. There's it's, going to be a big demonstration on uh, uh, Saturday evening. Yeah, um, we, we've had demonstrations Rabin before. Square. Well, we shall see what happens there. I don't see. know. We shall see how many people will come. Um, yeah. Every once in a while we have a big demonstration and then we drink coffee and then we go home. Yes, but, but we'll see. Hey, I'm not uh, losing my optimism. Don't get me wrong. But yes, let's see what happens on Saturday night. Yes, but, we but, but what we can do, and we are doing, I think, both of you, I'm trying to do it, is to resonate this event in our, our work. Uh, both the coronavirus, which is a, a, a fantastic, unimaginable event that really as you said before, Frank, like it's a wonderful image that it uh, had the roof open so we can now see some things that we didn't see before maybe. Uh, and both the other horrif horrifying events that when they resonate in the work, it resonates somewhere in some, somebody's mind or heart. I know it's, it's very small, it's very, very small. Still, it does something, eventually it will, create some change, has to. Well, <laughs> Ruti, you are very optimistic, I must say. <laughs> it's nice to see it. No, I, I believe, I think that we, we have no other choice than to continue to do what we are doing and uh, to try to uh, somehow to influence uh, the uh, public opinion um, the experience of the corona for me was a very interesting experience because what I was shocked by was the fact how easy it is to strike fear into the hearts of people. Uh, our leaders 
uh, prime minister, he was on television. And the first thing he said was he, he spoke about a catastrophe that humanity has not experienced since the Middle Ages, which is, of course, a, a huge exaggeration. Uh, and uh, people were open to fear. They were, so to speak, uh, they were ready to indulge in fear. Why do I say indulge in fear? Because when you are afraid, uh, everything is justified. Ad among other things, to stay at home, to put your head be below the pillow, to cover your ears and to isolate yourself and to say, oh, the, the, the situation is so bad, I cannot do anything. And the situation was not that bad in Israel. After all, luckily enough, we had only, only 280 uh, casualties, uh, people really? who died. Uh, and it is because the population in Israel is very young. The average age is be below 30, and our, um, our medical care is good, so to speak, in spite of everything. So people were not left on the street to die, and people were not uh, abandoned to their fate or to their poverty. Uh, there was no, I would say that we have been manipulated greatly, I mean badly, by our uh, politicians. Uh, because uh, again, the, this kind of fear that it just, it justified even the uh, creation of a very strange coalition in Israel with politicians betraying their uh, uh, electors, their voters. And the, everything was justified by the fact that there is COVID-19 outside, you know, everything was justified by it. And I think that this is, uh, we should fight against it. Therefore, I admire the, um, uh, the, the, the demonstrators in the hundred and, and odd cities in the United States who in spite of the corona uh, devastating those cities, they came out on the street and they did not care anymore about keeping two meters distance between one another. And they said uh, by the demonstration that um, uh, you cannot accept anymore the, the situation in which a young man is being strangled on the street because he is black. So I admired the, uh, the reaction of the, uh, and I still admire, I'm strongly, uh, I would say, um, impressed by the reaction of the American uh, public. And we have to learn from them. We have to learn how to react. And I think that this is one of the, the interesting and important lessons of what happens now in the United States, where you see that, uh, that the destiny of one person still counts. And uh, the blood of one person uh, cannot be ignored. And this is a lesson that we Israelis must, lesson, must learn. That's what I feel. But uh, I'm sorry, unlike Joshua, I'm not that convinced. I'm, I don't know for sure why we had so uh, not too many casualties. Um, the, we, we had a very strange situation. Very quickly, we went into a lockdown. Really quickly. I mean, I think one of the first early, night in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, one, one of the earliest. I don't know. I think one very early in, in relation to other countries um, before Europe, let's say two weeks, three weeks before. And um, what date was it? I, I, wow, I don't, I really it, don't was, know. it was the 14th Somewhere of uh, March. March, okay. March 14th, and, the beginning and of the I, I don't know anyone who had Corona. And mm, I don't think I have friends who, I, I actually know two people <laughs> uh, that live in Israel and five more people that live in other places. And I didn't see, I, if I talk, if, if there was no media, in a world without media, I wouldn't know that there was uh, an epidemic out there. And then I see on television uh, pictures from Spain and from Italy, and it's horrifying. I can't say that my government is lying to me and that there is no coronavirus. I couldn't tell that to myself, although uh, many people claimed that, that that's the situation, that we're being manipulated, that we're being deceived for political reasons. Um, I have the tendency to think in conspiracy and or in oh. <laughs> um, 
yeah, maybe conspiracy is not the right word in the Israeli case, but in uh, I tend to believe that my government doesn't take care of me or that's not its main perspective. But in this case, I was really confused and there was a load of information from all over the world. And I don't think anyone can say how come, I think we'll know that only retrospectively. What really yeah, happened? Yeah, yes, but uh, you know that yesterday the, there was a checkup that was done about the uh, Im uh, immunity, uh, immunity reaction of, uh, of the people, which yeah. is a different uh, kind of checkup from um, um, that they are doing with uh, the saliva and so on. And they found out that about 200,000 Israelis were uh, infected by the coronavirus, by the COVID 19. Without maybe, knowing. Maybe I was too. Maybe you were too. Maybe I was too. That's, that's so, the incredible uh, thing. Uh, officially, know. there were only some 16,000, 17,000 people who were diagnosed with coronavirus. But now we learn that there were more than 200,000 who, uh, who were infected by the virus and whose organisms uh, defended themselves against the virus. And they didn't even realize that the, the virus went through their system. So it, it, it is a, an interesting lesson to learn about the uh, degree of, uh, I would say, of um, danger with that virus. It depends probably a lot, uh, first of all, at the uh, average age of the society, of the whole nation, and secondly, of, uh, of the state of health of the nation. And of, uh, but if you, if you have a population that is very young, the death toll is very low, very low. But uh, the kind of uh, panic that was uh, created was uh, totally exaggerated. I'm sure about it. And I if, tend if, to believe if, so. I tend if, to believe if the, so. Even the numbers are, are right. If there were more than 200,000 people um, who uh, got the virus without even knowing it, it means that the lockdown did not do much. <laughs> because, uh, because if it's a quarter of a million Israelis who had, who had the virus, anyway, I think that the, the importance for me, at least, is to think what kind of theater we have to do because we saw how vulnerable our theater was uh, immediately. The, th the first thing that was um, that was um, locked down and uh, shut and uh, darkened were our theaters, and they are still darkened. And when they will be again, when the lights will go up again, we don't know yet what kind of uh, how the what kind of theater it will be. So I think we have to think uh, what, the, what, the, what is the lesson for us theater people? What can we do as theater people in, in order to confront uh, efficiently uh, such a pandemic that breaks out and disrupts, as I said before, our life? What can we do? This is the question that I'm putting to myself. And, and what I'm trying to answer. <laughs> or maybe observe. Yes. I'm sorry, Maya, you wanted to say something? I'm sorry. No, I wondered what kind of thoughts Joshua had about it. Mm. What kind of theater do you, uh, do you think? Well, well, I had some thoughts in which I shared with the younger um, students, theater students now. I, uh, and I call it a commando theater, or the, a, a kind of commando action of theater, which means not to rely anymore on the big halls, on the big venues, uh, but to create small groups that will go to people's homes and to perform uh, at the people's homes or on roof on rooftops of houses or on such places where uh, you cannot stop the, the theater from uh, continuing to, uh, to uh, function. This is what I think. I, can, I, I call, call it a commando theater or guerrilla theater, which means you in such a situation, where you are uh, kind of paralyzed, you have to find a way to continue your uh, action in society. Because I believe that uh, one of the dangers is that uh, the white public will say, okay, we can manage without theater. Look, they were, they've locked up their theaters for three months or so four months. And we, we are okay. We watch television. We see uh, all kinds of series on the, and the soap operas and life goes on. So I think that we have to make the theater more meaningful than it was before. And to make, uh, uh, as I said, to act as commando uh, units, 
uh, small groups go to people's where they where they congregate. Uh, if it is a synagogue, if it is a, a mosque, if it is a rooftop, as I said before, I don't know, uh, and go to the people again with the theater and not wait for them to be allowed to enter the, the main venues once more and to sit, you know, in capsules, as they say, as they call it now, uh, and to wear uh, these uh, masks over the face uh, throughout the show. I can't imagine this happening in the theater anyway. Okay, so this is what, what, what I think we should do. Ruth, you wanted to say something. Good. No, yes, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I'm still <clears throat> captured by the, the word that uh, Yoshua said in the first place, the, the disruption concept. And, um, and, and, and you're talking about the situation disrupting the, 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 the habits of the theater. Um, and, and the question is, how can the theater disrupt? Um, and this is like a concept we are exploring for quite a while. We had a laboratory. We just met you in Jerusalem when we had yeah. in the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies with Freddie. And, um, and, and this is uh, for me now a, a main issue. And, um, and around the pandemic, um, I created with, with my theater group an event uh, together with Ati Citron. Um, that and we were reading the the text of Arto, uh, the theater and the plague, which is such a fantastic text, and 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 that suggests Arto suggests to look at the action of the theater that is just like the the action of the pandemic, which is to shake something, to disrupt something. Uh, again, habits uh, to to expose. Uh, you mentioned this word hypocrisies, lies to, to take off the masks. So, um, so I think it reminds us uh, the situation in a way reminds us what we have to do. So uh, we, it was my theater, we created a Zoom event where we did an active and Arto, Artodian read, reading of the text, which was actually to dismantle the text um, to, to, to break it into, into wide units, to, to, we created a pandemic chorus. Uh, uh, we explored the text with, with the body, with the tongues, with the teeth uh, in a very active way. And, it, 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 and through language, we can do a lot of things. I mean, I, I understand, I understand uh, Yoshua that you say it's naive and uh, of course no, it's naive. Naive. Of course we can question whether the theater or art have any power um, yeah, and I understand it, uh, but this is what we know to do. So we, we can we can we can work with our techniques and our uh, ways in order to shake something. And this is a good time to shake something because maybe what you were saying before is that in in, in Israel the public was not shaken enough because maybe because we are used to curfews, we are used to go into shelters. It's not a new thing for us. We use for the government to, to make decisions uh, that, that, you know, like biopolitics, that, that they control our bodies, our, our, our ways of living. Um, so maybe we were not, it, it was not uh, a big enough disruption and, and the theater must go on and, 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 and keep the work going. Maybe, oh, uh, yeah. maybe I'll just uh, say um, there is a wonderful, wonderful Israeli uh, poet, poet, Avot uh, and he said uh, once um, in an interview or something, he said um, language to the, to the creator, to the author, is like a toy for a child. You don't know it until you break it. And only when you break it, you hear something, the sound of the language. And the sound of the language is meaningful. And of course, sometimes it can resonate in the heart or mind of one person. It's a lot because it could be exponential. <laughs> one person 
could do something to another person, to another person, to another person. If we don't have these beliefs, then we must stop doing theater because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just to make fun for people who have a lot of money to buy tickets in the big theaters, what for? Yeah. Maya, you want to react? Or? I, I wanted to, um, to share some of the thoughts that I've been having uh, during the, the lockdown. And it has okay. been, uh, I started thinking about it in the very early stages. That's <clears throat> again, <laughs> two months ago, three months ago, when my thoughts were running really quickly and I'm I, it evolved. Um, but there was a, such a rush uh, of streaming uh, theater, live streaming theater performances all over the globe. And um, of course, one thing that the epidemic and theater share is that they both need a crowd or they don't exist. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking <clears throat> theater <clears throat> must make itself essential. And it could, have, it could also be the task of theater in these times because if the result of the coronavirus crisis would be that people isolate and they don't uh, think that gathering is something that's uh, essential for them anymore, then I think theater should be the, the one, the, the medium that cares, carries the flag of um, um, showing, showing people why they should gather. But for that, theater has to really make itself essential. And I'm not so much talking about uh, content. Um, I think content can vary. I don't think theater should only be political, although I strongly believe in that. Um, I'm, I'm really talking about form, and that's something I've been very busy with uh, also before the coronavirus. Uh, but uh, now it's really, it was a real catalyst for me um, to think about the ways that theater uh, uses its technology uh, the characteristics of the medium to tell stories, because if you can stream it, then then you're not using it. Um, um, because I think that film and uh, and I'm talking about realistic theater. Uh, um, I think film, television, and now even video games can do it much better. Uh, imitate reality. And I think that theater uh, should not do that because if people say I could watch it online or I could watch it, a, a video registration of it, then, then there's no reason really to, if it's a life risk, then yes, then maybe it's not essential. And what I'm, what I'm busy also, I'm writing my PhD about that, about the narratology of theater and how to use uh, characteristics, the, the, um, how do we, Film, filmmakers, the grammar of film is based on the medium, point of view shots, camera movements. It's all, uh, it's all um, essential to the structure of the narrative. It's not, um, it's not just aesthetics. It's, it's really uh, content and form are, are one. And theater, um, the characteristics of the medium of theater, which are the corporeal presence of performers and, and the audience, the liveness, uh, the material, materialism of uh, things on stage, all these things uh, should be incorporated into the grammar of the storytelling in, in such a way that you, 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 you have, it's, it's a different experience of uh, perceiving a story. You have to be, you have to crowd, you have to be present in order to get the experience. And I think that uh, especially theater directors, as a playwright, I really, in my plays, I try to stimulate such strategy. But of course, um, there is no really uh, the theory of theater narratology as there is in film. Um, so directors sometimes do it intuitively, but but it's not established. And I think uh, this is, this should be a next step. And that's what I'm busy with. I would like to react and, and say that, first of all, it's very interesting that you're writing your PhD about it. I would love to read. Uh, and- um, I have to wait. But I have, I'm patient. 
but uh, I really have to tell you that I feel that forms are more political than content. Content can cover, I mean, there are a lot of theater plays that are talking about, you know, coexistence and, you know, very good, nice things. But the form is fascistic. And when you speak about points of view, the very issue of points of view is uh, of polyphonic points of views uh, is something that carries a message of liberty. So the forms, mm -hmm. uh, 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 sometimes the forms, the, 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 the rotten forms cover, uh, no, 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 they, they expose, <laughs> the, the, the forms expose um, that the content, the content is, you know, just speaking uh, shallowly about something and not really activating some need or some inner power of, or for, for, do some, for doing something, for, for a change. And really, I'm exploring it all the time, the, 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 the messages in the forms them, that, that are encoded in the forms themselves. themselves. And, and when you, you read a play or you watch a theater piece, you can decipher the deep content when you really observe the forms. This is really a very important thing for me now. Um. I would uh, also emphasize the importance of form. I think it has to do with the contents. Uh, form is not uh, standing by itself, of course, and uh, there is no form without material, and there is no material without form. Uh, but what I think is that one of the lessons of the uh, corona crisis is that uh, people, many people become redundant. Uh, they are now talking about it, that the lesson that uh, some uh, enterprises learned is that they can do without 30% uh, of their personnel. They have sent them out to uh, an unpaid vacation. They got, uh, I mean, the uh, unemployed people on unpaid vacation were paid by the government, a kind of uh, minimal salary. And the enterprises uh, learned an interesting lesson I read today on an economical uh, newspaper in Israel that maybe that uh, some of, uh, well, 20% or 30% of the manpower that was put on unpaid vacation uh, should not uh, be uh, re-employed uh, uh, by their enterprises. And the enterprises will become more, uh, will maximize their rentability. So this is one. Uh, this is one lesson, I think, and not only lesson. This is a reality that we have to make our audience aware of that they may become redundant as people, uh, uh, and the redundancy is a situation with which the human psyche cannot uh, put up with. So I think that one of the th of the things that the theater should do is to create a situation in which, the, in which the spectator will be very interactive with the show. Uh, because the theater has that kind of uh, quality that it can uh, create a situation of interactivity. Well, which a film cannot do. A, a film, you, you watch a, a finished uh, work of art, whereas a theater performance is something that happens now, which means it happens from minute to minute, and you can think of a form that will uh, invite or provoke uh, the interactivity of the uh, onlooker, of the spectator. And it, give, it will give the spectator a feeling that he counts, that he's not there only. In, yeah, well, he, he becomes an actor in a way, or he becomes active. A spectator. One, one of the, what, sorry? There's a what term, you, spect actor. Spect actor, okay, spect actor, yes, you, it's a nice yeah. term. Uh, anyway, uh, so I think that uh, this is one of the things that people of the younger generation are uh, quite uh, used to, I mean, they are used to surf uh, in the internet. They are used to surf, which means to choose their links and to enter into uh, the links that they have chosen and and in the middle of, uh, let's say, of uh, surfing into a certain uh, uh, location, uh, they are changing direction and so on. 
So one of the, we, I say we, because I have been cooperating with an Austrian director by the name of Paulus Manker. And we created a, in 1996, a, a kind of a theater event about Alma Mahler. Uh, it was called Alma, which uh, was a kind of journey show. And the audience was invited to behave as a camera, each person as a camera, which means you entered a location where a scene took place and you were allowed or you were invited to choose your distance from the actors. You, you were allowed to turn around them while they were performing and look at them from any uh, angle you choose. You could come to an extreme close up to the actors. I mean, to come as close as possible to the actors while they are performing and acting, and you were allowed also to uh, to stay from and observe the scene from a distance, behave as a camera. Now, I had an idea uh, following that experience because this show that we created in 1996 has been running for like uh, 25 years. It was the sh still shown last summer in, uh, in Neuwien, in a, a, a small town near Vienna. Uh, and uh, the, the lesson that I learned from it was to allow the audience or to invite them to use their uh, smartphones as cameras and not only to observe the uh, action that is taking place in front of them in, in, in a scene into which they have uh, entered, but to allow them to film the scenes and then to send the, uh, the results of, their, of what they have filmed or recorded, so to speak, to a certain um, uh, address, and it will be re-edited uh, into a kind of, uh, of a, uh, drama, and they will be able to watch the drama that has been created, the, the video drama that has been created into, in which they have taken part as uh, spect <laughs> actors, yeah. and uh, then, we can invite them again and create a kind of ongoing relationship with that audience that was that has been active during the show. In other words, to sum it up, I would say that because we are all now uh, threatened by redundancy, and as I feel that we people of the theater, we are uh, the next ones to become redundant in our society. And there are tendencies to say, well, why spend so much money on the theaters? And we can, we can do it all uh, over the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, cyberspace, uh, as we are doing now what we are doing. Yes, uh, the Zoom. We are using the Zoom. I think that we are uh, threatened by redundancy, and we are not the only ones. But a, a, a big chunk of our society may become redundant in a short while. So I think this is one, one thing that we have and we can confront the people with. And I would say if I would now address an audience of 30 spectators in a kind of show, and I would say, okay, who of you uh, is on uh, uh, unpaid vacation? Who is afraid of not uh, getting his job again? Who is who is sure not to get his job again? What are you going to do with it? Uh, well, I think that uh, I agree with the, what Ruth said and what you said, Maya, that form counts very much and that form can be, be a revolutionary. If this form is uh, <laughs> um, dealing with material, with explosive material. If we are not dealing with explosive material, the form will not be revolutionary. But if we deal with TNT or with dynamite, then we have to handle it. And we know that we are handling something that is explosive. And uh, that's why I think that uh, we have to look out and now and to understand, to be very alert and to understand what is going on, what is taking place in our society. Because as uh, Maya, you said it, I think, or Ruth, that we are now in the danger of becoming a, a kind of dictatorship in Israel. Uh, I, I call it a demonocracy, not a democracy, but a demonocracy, a kind mm. of a, 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 a democracy manipulated by demons. The coronavirus is a demon 
then we have uh, the demon of the uh, of the of the uh, outer enemies and so on and so forth um and so i think that we are the, the western uh, democracies are undergoing a very crucial uh, development in these days these very days and we as people of the theater must be on the alert and not uh, let it just uh, go un under our radar systems. Yeah, that's what I have to say. So <clears throat> in that time, um, also in confinement and, you know, um, Maya, you spoke about it, also both of you. Do, do you think your next work will be influenced by it. Do you think, are you already having some uh, thoughts you might not have before? And also what are you preparing? Let's say it's another half a year, perhaps a year. I don't know how it will be in Israel. It was successful if the numbers are right, the lockdown because maybe of that experience of a government that does that all the time. And people are used to, to um, obeying it in comparison to France, for example, but um, um, what will be what will be concrete things you will be doing in the next half year or year? What, are you planning shows? Are you um, will there be what 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 do you hear? Will there be small audiences uh, allowed or not? Are people out there that uh, saying we need the theater back? Is it is there anything uh, that society asks you theater makers at the moment say come back do this, and if so, what will it be? Well, I'm as a play. Oh, Ruth, you go ahead. No, 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 you, you please. <laughs> um, as a playwright, I, I busy myself less with with those questions of uh, inside or outside. Or um, I write what I what I have to write, what I have the urge to write. And I'm lucky to have uh, my next world premiere already in October in Memmingen in Germany. And I'm already busy writing close to my first draft uh, and they said it will be on stage they said it will happen and theaters will open will be open uh, yes they have very very specific um, um, rules or I don't know uh, to uh, what is it uh, every fourth seat people will sit in every fourth seat in the big uh, on a big stage and the actors cannot touch each other for me, it's great. For the way I'm writing, I think it's going to be very, uh, very interesting to see what what uh, the director uh, Sapir Heller is going to make um, make of it. Uh, the funny thing is that it's a play that I started to write long before I could even dream of an epidemic in my craziest dreams. And when the when the epidemic started, I was a little bit pan panicked because I thought that's almost like I'm writing about it and I don't know I think it's really not interesting to react on something while it happened I don't think I have the perspective I don't have the spatial or the temporal distance to reflect on it in a in an effective way I'm, but it's not it's not about an epidemic but it's really it's about people locked in a house and um and I think that the situation gave me a lot of input because it's really about, in the end, it's, it's about people and people that are in a very strong situation of mm -hmm. uncertainty and they have to deal with each other, not really knowing what's outside, what's inside, who's who, what's, what, what are we facing, reflecting on the past. It's, um, that's what you I'm said, busy with at the moment anyway. Yeah, you said it's a catalyst. This time it's a catalyst and forms are changing. But what will be different? It, it, what, if, you, if, if, it's po if it's possible to point at that, what, what changed in your writing? Again, as, as you said that I said, it's a catalyst. It's, it's just gave me uh, more motivation to, go, to, to be busy with the same things I was busy with. And... Um, um, I'm really looking all the time for ways to tell stories in a way that uh, can reflect somehow our perception 
young people don't go to the theater in, in Israel, at least that's what they say. And I'm not talking about young people like 20 years old, just people that were born into uh, screens. They, I think their perception of reality is very uh, distinct. Uh, I'm on, on really on the, on the verge of that generation, but um, the single perspective of the, the realistic theater has to offer is not communicating with their, our perception of reality anymore. And I'm really busy all the time with uh, dissecting the mechanisms of the narrative and I'm doing it uh, in my writing uh, to stimulate directors also to come up with interesting forms on stage. And, and uh, I just took it a step further. I mean, if one, if one looks at a series of my plays, then you can see how I keep um, developing it, mm -hmm. thinking how we can make, how we can tell stories in, in, a, in, a, in ways that are as complex as we experience reality. Good. No. <laughs> um, yeah, about the situation. Um, since I'm working with a very small theater group in Tel Aviv, so um, so technically we have no problems actually because we anyhow we work in small venues. Anyhow, we work in houses. <laughs> anyhow, we are in a very um, uh, flexible situation with our performances. They don't, they don't need big sets or, or big... I, I, I would never do things in, in this big um, remote theaters where, 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 the, where the actors are so remote from the audience. So, so we have no technical problems and we did take the time of this this was a, like a gift of time to that we can't perform in this month so so we could go inside ourselves explore uh, our work our desires and when i think forward um actually i i'm thinking about uh, walter benjamin that he's talking about the storyteller and and he's saying that the storyteller um he has an advice but by telling something about an old story, something that happened in the past, he's actually talking or giving advice to a story that is now being ongoing. So I find myself somehow thinking a lot these days about old myth, old myth, old, old, old uh, Hebrew myth. And I don't have any idea how does it connect to the situation, but that's what comes through me talking through very old scripts. Maybe something will happen out of it. No. Well, uh, I, uh, shortly before the Corona crisis broke out, I finished writing a play about uh, people competing with robots or robots competing with people and uh, kicking them out of their uh, jobs. And uh, the play has been now translated into uh, Chinese Mandarin and is going probably to be uh, performed in Beijing in the coming season. And uh, it, is, it has been translated into German as well. Uh, I wrote it in rhymes, the, the whole play. So how can uh, it be in Mandarin? Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> they can rhyme in, in Chinese Mandarin as well. They can yeah. rhyme. Yeah, uh, well, of course. Uh, and um, so the, the play is about the, um, I would say, about, well, why did I write it in rhymes? Because uh, the people are trying to outsmart the robots, but they find out that the robot is rhyming uh, as well as they are, <laughs> and even better than they do. And uh, there, there is a kind of competition in the beginning and the ongoing competition then, of course, of uh, who is rhyming better, the people or the, or the robots. And uh, at the end, you don't know anymore who, who is outsmarting whom. 
uh, because because we are confronting the now a situation where robots are almost a, a full and total imitation of a human being you know uh, you don't know anymore if they feel anything or if they pretend to feel but they can have reactions as uh, as if they have some feelings uh, and then you ask yourself are we robots are we pretending that we have some feelings or uh, what is robotic about human the human being and what is human about the robots and well the play is dealing with those questions in a way and uh, i'm very curious to see what the directors will make of it when it uh, gets on the stage from the page to the stage because it's uh, meant to be with music and uh, singing and move movement and so how will the robots move and of course the idea is that the robots will be played by live actors uh, and uh, i think this is in, in itself is a kind of challenge uh, so this was uh, my last uh, my most recent work and uh, i'm still into um, consulting and talking with the musicians who are composing the music for the show Yeah, it's a big question that, uh, you know, in the mind of artificial intelligence, we are all handicapped because our thinking in their mind is very, very, you know, very limited. And where does it, where does it go um, together? One question to you guys, and I hope it's a, a kind of a right question. Um, um, Brecht said, you know, basic function of theater is, you know, a bystander sees a bicycle accident, you know, runs into a car, a cop comes and the cop said, what happened? And the bystander acts it out, said, well, I was standing here, was walking, then the person came from here, the car came here, the bike, but he flipped over. And I think uh, the car driver didn't pay attention or the bicycle rider, you know, do something wrong. He said, this is what theater is, we show on stage something of what happened to uh, systems. It's no longer about individual fates, he loves stories or whatever there. In a way, what happened in New York to come back, you know, the filming, I think it's a 17 year old, a woman who, who filmed the, the murder of Floyd, you know, she's, and they said, this is what happened. And uh, Susan Sontag wrote that great essay, significant one, I reread it about the suffering of others, about the images of suffering, what they do to us. And uh, she goes back to, uh, Quotes from uh, from uh, the Ilias, from the Ulysses, uh, from uh, Michelangelo's drawings. How to how he instructed artists to draw images of war. Goya um, about uh, Spanish Civil War, about uh, of course images of a Holocaust, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, civil uh, uprisings and civil struggle in the sec in the sixties. Re repeating of images and, um, and she, she says, you know, what will we remember just the image? Do we really meditate on what it was? The image shows the end, the death. You can even own the image, all, all these questions. And she is kind of hesitant, if I understand right, to say, you know, uh, that they really even communicate what really happened. As Brecht said, a photography about the Ford car factory doesn't really say much about the Ford car factory and about capitalism, but it's real. So, so how do you also, and because she mentioned the images also, of course, of, a, of World War II, of a Holocaust in her essay, it's very central part in her essay. How do you all think about images like the ones we see now? How does one deal with it? And, uh, and what do they carry in them? And how do we as theater artists who also have time and duration and, uh, and stories and how, how do how do we act it is that change something what we saw there but and we talk about change in art and theater and the contribution we make but what what how do you deal with the all these images for sure you must also carry within yourself and in your work you know you wrote about about um, the holocaust for example yeah Um, I think that, uh, well, it, 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 
it is different from one playwright to the other, from one director to the other. Uh, the importance of images and the, the relationship between image and word, image, uh, visual image and language. Uh, and of course, in the theater, um, you deal with images, but you deal also with language and, uh, and how do you deal with it? Uh, I am very much, I would say, influenced by Sartre's thinking about the situation. The situation is uh, the, uh, um, th that part of reality in which we are involved and in which we are expressing our values, bringing them into action and revealing or uh, showing or revealing who we are, what we are. And the situation for me, the situation is very important. So, um, well, you know, uh, there is that uh, scene uh, of in, uh, the cameraman, in the film, the cameraman by uh, uh, Buster yeah. Keaton, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Buster Keaton, where he's filming a row taking place, a struggle between two guys in the in Chinatown, I think, and uh, then a knife is falling on the side from the hand of one of the guys, and the cameraman rushes, he takes the knife, he, he gives it back to the one of the opponents, and goes back to film <laughs> the the event. He becomes mm -hmm. involved in the event. And you don't know anymore if he's uh, looking for a good image or for good footage, or he, he was so much involved into the situation that he forgot that the, someone is going to pay with his life while he's filming. And what is more, more important for him, the filming or the, uh, or the situ Well, is he aware of the situation in which he is involved? And this is one of the things that I felt when I was writing about the Holocaust, when I wrote my play Ghetto. I was at mo moments, I, it was based on description of situations that took place, the situations that were described in diaries of people who were involved in, uh, in action at the time of the Holocaust. And I found myself sometimes so involved in the situations, so fascinated by the situations because they were fascinating that I, I enjoyed bringing into the play things that are monstrous. And it shocked me because I, I felt myself in the situation of uh, the cameraman of uh, Buster Kitten, uh, who is so much involved with his art, with his profession, uh, that he forgets that he takes the knife and brings it into the hand of the killer in order to show the killing. So uh, this is an interesting question that you have put here. <laughs> and I think that we have, uh, in our profession, in our art, it's a very dangerous art because you bring to the stage things that are sometimes uh, showing the evil side in the human being, the evil part in human situations. And we all know that there is nothing more enjoyable on the stage than to play out and to act out uh, situations in which the evil qualities of the human being are being exposed or being put into action. So this is one of the things I don't know. We deal with the, with the, with the evil of our time in a way, in the images and in the language. That's what I can say. As, as I said earlier, I'm um, I'm busy both in my writing and in my research. Uh, I'm busy with theater and narratology. And now one of the basic, the questions that narratology asks is who speaks? That's the narrator. And who sees? And that's the focalizer. Um, I also wrote my master thesis about it. It's called Focalizing Bodies. It was um, published in 2010. Um, I think theater, uh, unlike other, unlike the screen media where the camera is hidden, one of its forces is that it can show who creates the image. 
very much influenced by my professor from the Amsterdam University, Kathy Rotger. Um, and, and the question of who owns images is very, is very strong. And I think that theater can expose the mechanisms of the creation of the image in a way that um, I, uh, Ruth talked about film as fascist, the form of film as fascist or something, right? Or aggressive or violent? Forms, forms, like yes. any forms. Uh, so I think that's what we mean. That's what I mean, that it's, it's uh, <clears throat> eliminates its violence when you can see who holds the camera. Uh, it's very interesting what you both said, and it's a very complex question, so I, I could just uh, react very little about it. Uh, I myself somehow, f I find myself trying to avoid um, direct images uh, and actually create, oh, if I check the works I'm trying to, to do, there is always a gap between the image and, and, and the speech or the image and the, and the, and, and, and the meaning of the image. So I'm, I'm just trying to, so through this gap, ask, ask questions about representation. And by asking questions about representation, you can ask questions about reality. I can just give a very simple example. Um, I once did a, a piece about the war that was in Israel, the Yom Kippur War, the war that was here in 73, but, but I did it in 2000 and something. And naturally, the text uh, of the writer, Samech uh, dealt a lot with images of war, of, of, of guns and explosions and, 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 and tanks and, and, and all kinds of things. But on stage, you saw none of it. So by asking yourself, how would you put on stage an image of shooting or of explosion of, or being sh shooting somebody else or being shot by somebody? So by asking what would be the image, you begin to ask moral questions about what is it to shoot at somebody or to be in a situation that, that somebody shoots at you. So, so, I, so I, I put in question the, the connection between the image and the meaning. And, and I think that by this question, um, we, we try to crack something in the, in the solid knowings of what are we talking about and ask new questions. Yeah. And these are incredible uh, questions. We had earlier on, earlier on, the Julie Joseph, uh, Keith Joseph Atkins, who runs the New Black Fest uh, in New York City, is a great um, group of writers. And um, we have, they have been at the Siegel with the Trevor Martin killings and others. They wrote plays, commission plays. But then, of course, it's that recording of a handy of that 17 year old uh, woman who, who, and something happened, you know. So um, it's a big, big, big question always now what does it need? You know, what's the time, the atmosphere and the confinement? Is it connected to COVID? What's, when does something, does something uh, change? And I think um, we in theater and performance, of course, uh, are, have always been historically over centuries, I think, part of the complex struggle for freedoms and have made a contribution, the mm -hmm. struggle for liberties. And, and we are continuing it. And all you, of course, are... Um, um, examples of uh, um, thinking and acting and uh, putting something into a form that uh, reflects what we what we see and uh, and uh, helps is part of the change of the world. Um, slowly, also coming to 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 us from the end of the show. What what do you feel? Um, is the most, the biggest, we talked about it, but still, what do you feel uh, for, if you yeah, had to talk to young artists, as uh, Joshua said, you know, what do you feel is the big lesson? What really shall we take with us from this time and not forget? And, um, and what is something, we are still in confinement here. So what, what do we still should focus on? What do you all feel is essential?
I think it's essential to ask questions. I, I don't think anyone has really answers at the moment of what should come next. Um, that's what I think. Yeah. Well, I, I would uh, add to it that one of the lessons is not, I mean, not to take uh, authority for granted. Whoever pretends to uh, talk to you authoritatively, you should suspect that there is some second thought behind it, some interest that the guy is trying to uh, to garner and uh, to um, to achieve. Uh, this is one of the lessons that I drew from uh, the last few months. I'm watching television with a great feeling of. Uh, suspicion that people who detain authority, who have the authority in their hands, they are abusing of it. They are not using it correctly. I don't trust them. And I think that one of the lessons is to, to tell people or to teach people or to ask people or to share with people the feeling that they are responsible for what they think, for what they are doing and they should not um, um, kind of free themselves of the responsibility because there is someone who is taking the responsibility. I think one of the lessons is that we have to renew uh, the, the foundations of democracy and to, to look into it very carefully and to see that democracy has been has been revealed in its weakness, I think, in the last three or four months. And uh, we have to make, in Hebrew, there is a word tikkun. Tikkun is correction or repairing or, and I think our democracies need a lot of tikkun, a lot of correction and repairing. And uh, this is uh, one of the lessons that I, I would like to, to share with uh, my audience in the future that we have to take care of a big tikkun of our society. Well, I see, I see it in our society in Israel. I see it now in what happens in the United States. I think the, I don't want to tell the Americans what they have to do with their society, but it looks like they need a lot of tikkun in the United States. And this is, is true about other countries as well, and about, about our country, about our society, of course, too. Tikkun. Wow, you know things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still in the class. I, I am sorry. I, I didn't have the. I, I haven't learned the lesson yet. It's still ongoing. Uh, I can't conclude anything. Maybe I can just say something small. And I'm, I'm learning from my students. And here in New York, I was uh, after the spring uh, break. Uh, we went to Zoom teaching. I was teaching here at Juilliard, and. Um, so, and I was teaching storytelling. So I decided to, to give up all my plans and ask the students to, to tell stories about the situation. And one of the students that was so beautiful, um, her reaction or her way to talk about the situation is that she recalled a story about a Russian cosmonaut that was isolated. Uh, so she, she, she had these questions about isolation and, 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 and the Russian cos cosmonaut that was isolated in his space, spacecraft and suffered a lot for, from some things there. But then he was able to open himself to this situation of isolation and, and found a moment of bliss. So I really hope I will find also sometimes a moment of bliss, but I haven't found it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a inc incredible times and we, we, we do live in and this is good advice to you know, really to question authority or to say we stop and we ask students questions, you know, or ask others, we listen and, um, and to find, uh, 
uh, find ways to, um, to, to, to reinvent what we are doing. I think it's, um, it's not something that we did on our own. We have been a way forced to do it, but still it is a chance, it's something significant. And I think uh, the world has already changed and we will slowly um, discover what comes, what comes out of it. It's really wonderful of all of you to, um, to join us. And I'm sorry that it's such a short time. And, um, and of course, each one of you could have been the guest, but I think all together, I think we got also a polyphonic uh, 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 view of the situation. And thank you for sharing also so honestly and openly the uh, situation and your country in Israel and also reflecting, you know, on the suffering that is really taking place here um, in, in the US. And yes, we do need a lot of tikkun and, uh, and I hope it will, it will happen. So um, next week, again, we will have uh, Jonathan McCoy from the uh, uh, here from New York, Tamela Woodard, James Scruggs, Nigel Smith, Woody King Jr. to talk uh, about what, what we are going through here. Tomorrow we will have um, uh, Avra Sidoropoulou from Greece and Cyprus, where she uh, will tell a bit about the situation there, the virus, but also the situation with refugees uh, and what's happening in, in Europe, how we're dealing with this in the middle of all the um, corona crisis. Um, Ashley uh, Tara, young director who did Carol Churchill's play, Mad Forest, about a revolution uprising, about the killings in the streets of Romania, a moment perhaps closer we are now than we ever have been. And the way she created something with her um, software colleagues and coders uh, where she combined, I think, a live theater and uh, studio Zoom art in, to something really interesting, a way of art, I feel, a new art piece, I thought it was interesting what she found. And um, so we will um, talk on that, on these new forms we really uh, do need and um, to retell the same stories we had. So really thank you for, for, for sharing, for asking questions. We will have better questions um, after this and uh, let's stay in contact. And, uh, and, um, and uh, as the Buddhists say, you know, they said about art and theater is a joyful participation in the sorrows of others and the sorrows of the world. And I think, um, this is what we have to, but at the moment we are angry and uh, very upset. And, um, and, uh, but as you pointed out, and that's a good reminder, and this is also a good thing that the uprising is there, that people get outraged. And, um, and that is something that um, is a, a good, it's a good that it will come out of it. So um, thanks to Halron for hosting us. Uh, Thea, TJ and uh, Travis, thanks to my Siegel team, Andy and uh, Sun Yang, and I hope to um, here and see you again uh, all over in New York. We have a cup of coffee to our listeners. Thank you for taking time out of your life. I know how much is out there, how busy and how full days get. It's important to listen and that you are out there listening also to our colleagues and friends from around the world. The artist is of real significance. It's meaningful for them, but it's also hopefully meaningful for you and uh, uh, Emmanuel and, uh, uh, from the Théâtre de la Ville in Paris said, you know, they, it's also important now that we do a change ourselves, that we do an authentic change and that we look at ourselves. He for the time said, I'm not going to look at any images. I just listen. I'm on my phone and uh, they're changing their theater uh, coming, um, coming out of this. And I think also that's what I hear from all of you today. So thank you for sharing and to our audience, uh, stay tuned and stay safe and um, and uh, I hope one day we will have a big theater festival, a great expression of art and life here in New York where you all and your work will be shown. So uh, talk to you soon and thank you for, for sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Joshua, Maya, and thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.